Test on seven. Test good, good. Bill, Bill, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Bill? Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to the very first, the inaugural TAFAF Afternoons. Uh, we've always, we've had TAFAF Coffee Talks since the uh, beginning of the fair in fall of 2016, but we were always in the restaurant at the other end of the hall and had immediately had to turn around so that the um, uh, restaurant could become a restaurant. And here now we have the great luxury of being in this beautiful room dedicated now to the cultural program. So it's wonderful to be here at four o'clock in the afternoon to greet you. We have obviously an incredibly um, well-informed group of people to discuss this topic. I won't delay, I just want to introduce you to Thomas Marks, editor of Apollo Magazine, who is our moderator and he'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda, and thank you all for coming. Um, what that means, it doesn't have to turn into a restaurant. We're going to talk for five hours about whether museums should charge. <laughs> so settle in. Uh, let me introduce the panel. I'm going to give brief introductions, because uh, I think, really, all of their positions and, and senior roles speak for themselves. And then we're going to move ahead with talking about uh, why charge or why not charge and the relationship between admission fees to museum communities and how they might define their missions. Uh, we'll talk for about probably 45 minutes and then I'm gonna open the floor to some uh, bullets from the audience. Uh, so let me introduce uh, the panel as we go along here. Uh, Salvador Salot Pons, uh, immediately on my left, is the director of the Detroit Institute of Art. Uh, Kaywin Feldman is the director of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Tom Lockman, Lohman is the director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum and president of ICOM US at the moment. And Daniel Weiss uh, is the president and CEO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to start on this topic by just asking all four of you to briefly, please, I'm sure you've had to do it at length to your trustees and others, uh, set out your own institution's positions or, uh, uh, as regards museum charging. And we're going to start at this end because I suspect when we get to the other end, the Met is probably the reason why we're here in the first place, possibly. <laughs> so, so let's start here, Salvador. Will you set your position out? And what's defined that as well? Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me here and um, participating in this panel. I am the director of the Detroit Institute of Arts. And uh, as, may, as some of, of you may know, it is five years that the DIA enjoys um, so financial support from three counties surrounding the museum. 
it is um, a millage. And a millage is a tax based on property and the residents of those three counties support 70% of the operating uh, expenses of the, of the DIA. In exchange of that, they, uh, they receive uh, not only free admission to the DIA, but also a number of programs that include uh, free transportation for schools into the museum, for seniors, and a number of community partnerships. And, and how many people, Ross? How many people uh, approximately in that area? Uh, how many people living in the uh, metro Detroit, Detroit area? area yes. uh, four to five million. Uh, Kaywin. Uh, so I arrived in Minneapolis uh, 10 years ago, and I was asked by the board chair to do a strategic plan in six months, and so nothing like getting started. And so I spent a lot of intense time in that period listening to our board and staff and volunteers. And the number one thing I learned about the Minneapolis Institute of Art is that we care the most deeply about accessibility, that that is our number one value and concern. And accessibility is in our mission statement. And um, we have had free admission for over 20 years now. And uh, free admission for us is one element of accessibility. It's not the whole picture, but it's a very important. And I'd never worked for a free museum before. I used to always think sort of the model that people need to pay for what they value and care for. And after learning how absolutely core it is to the very existence of our museum, I, I decided right away that it was the most important thing that I should never change. So uh, thank you for talking about arrival. Uh, when I arrived at the Athenaeum about two and a half years ago, we had just reopened after a long construction and renovation project, at the end of which the board had decided to raise the adult admission fee to 15 bucks from 10. So about a month before I showed up for work, there was a, a Twitter war involving Tyler Green and, and other people about uh, the moral imperative of keeping museums free. Anyway, quite apart from that, um, I very early on talked to my board leadership about a strange phenomenon that was in the data that I was finding as I oriented myself to Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut's one of the most wealthy states uh, per capita. We generate one of the highest GDPs per capita of any state in the union. And yet, the residents of our cities are, the, are among the poorest uh, in the country, and so there is a uh, promise zone, remember Barack Obama's promise zones, there's a promise zone three quarters of a mile north of the museum, and the median household income in Hartford is $29,000. So uh, I asked my board chair, I said, listen, I've, I've looked at the data, on the free days, we have about 40% participation by residents of the city of Hartford, and on the non-free days, which is you know the entire opening hours except for the three hours on, that we were free a month, we have extremely low participation of, of people that live in the city of Hartford. So I want to I wanna create a program that will allow anybody to come whenever we're open uh, without charging. And we've called that constituency Wadsworth Welcome, and we've subscribed uh, 3,000 households in a year and a half. Uh, we launched it around uh, Labor Day of 2016. So that means that one in 18 households in the city of Hartford uh, enjoys free access to the museum. And they come as members, as our other membership base comes. In addition to that, we've had a library pass program that has, you know, you can check out the ability to come to the museum at any of the public libraries in Connecticut. That's 169 town libraries uh, and, and numerous other ways of, of getting in free. Libraries are free, of course. Yes, our libraries are free in Connecticut, uh, for, for now. <laughs> Dan Daniel, if you could set out the position. So I, I'll speak briefly about the Metropolitan in the first instance, and we can get into it as much as people want to. For 47 years, the Met has had a, uh, an experimental, fundamentally a social experiment. For 47 years, admission to the Metropolitan is in pay as you wish, where the public has been invited to reflect on whatever they would like to pay. There is a recommended amount that people could pay, and that has been what we've done. For about the last 12 years or so, that policy has, be, has failed and it, the average amount people pay over that period of time has declined by almost 70%. So we were faced with a very complicated question recently about what we do about that as we try to shore up the resources to support the Met. 
we can have a larger conversation about who ought to pay for culture in our society, what is the role of government, what impact does that have on freedom of expression. Those were all questions we thought about very carefully before we formulated the policy we have now, which is we are pay as you wish for residents of New York state and city, and we can explain why that is, so that policy does not change for them. Everyone else has to pay the mandatory fee of $25 to, for adults, $17 for uh, seniors, $12 for students, and free for anyone under 12. Um, that's the policy we have today. So maybe I'll stop there because there's a lot here to talk about. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we're going to move in and around the, the decision of the Met in, in the conversation that follows. Um, I thought you used a really interesting phrase, Tom, uh, this idea, uh, you're talking about Tyler Green and, and this idea of the moral imperative. And, and I guess the question for all of the panel is, do you think that museums should be free? Would you like the Met to be totally free, Daniel? I think in an ideal world, it would be terrific for all cultural institutions to be free. In an ideal world, it would be terrific for all educational institutions to be free for people to make decisions about how they access education and enrichment on the basis of their interests. But ultimately, excellence has to be paid for. Someone has to pay for it. So if the government in our society, the government has decided not to support cultural institutions for the most part, there are exceptions to that, including in Washington, who then should pay? In my view, co-investment is not a bad approach. Everyone who benefits from the institution one way or the other should be asked to contribute in some way, one way or the other. Kaywin, I sense that's not necessarily the position of a museum like Minneapolis, where actually it seems that the museum being free is a principle of the museum's mission. Is that right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, we believe in accessibility for all, and something that I frequently argue is that um, accessibility for all does mean for all, and the assumption is always that free admission really benefits uh, low-income visitors. And um, it's absolutely not exclusively the low-income visitors. And I find that when you're free, people can actually run in whenever they want to and see that one painting. And, uh, um, and so for everyone, if you really want museum visiting to become a learned behavior, uh, I think that free admission actually allows people to do that. Um, but can I say something else? On the you know, moral imperative question, I do not think that it is a moral imperative today. I think it will be a moral imperative in the future. As America is changing so rapidly, and you know, America predicted to be a um, majority people of color country by 2043, the way that our country is shifting power dynamics, I do profoundly believe that in whatever it is, 20 years, that the um, peril of art museums being exclusively associated with people with money will be to our detriment. And that um, as our country becomes more and more focused on, particularly in the areas of culture, on issues of race and class, um, it is critical as these sort of institutions that are so associated with um, wealth and power and, um, that we need to change that dynamic. Tom, did you want to add something? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the rhetoric around our, our launch of our Wadsworth Welcome program, which was uh, communicating it cost more than anything else, and uh, Aetna was a wonderful and silent partner in, in allowing us to connect with the public that lives closest to us. Um, the, the, the brand, the branding on it, or the, the message, the truth, it belongs to you. In other words, we hold this this institution, its collection, in the public trust, and it's it's the community. It's the community. However, that's that's wrought for us. Community means Connecticut. Um, for for each institution, it may have a different sense of of who its immediate service area is. But I'd like to talk about our place as a place of global consequence. That is that is Connecticut's flagship arts organization, and it and that's predicated on the idea that it belongs to you. I think there's no question the public services should be at the center of this conversation. But I think it's a more subtle question than that. The Metropolitan, for example, just cite the institution I know the best and the one that has just made this policy change. Uh, we, are, we do our work in service of the public in myriad ways. We have, for example, the largest internship program in the world. 
and we invite young professionals to come to the museum from all over the world to participate in our work and we pay for that. We have one of the largest conservation facilities in the world. We generate more scholarship than most any other cultural or educational institution. All of those things are investments we make in the public good. We could and absolutely reflected on a decision, we should, maybe we should just be free. We have a $3 billion endowment, we could be free. That wouldn't even be that difficult to do. But we wouldn't be able to do everything else I just described. We wouldn't do much scholarship, we wouldn't have much conservation. There were all these things that would fall by the wayside. And what makes the Metropolitan, I think, exceptional is the service it provides to the community locally. Those people can come in for a dime if they wish. And to the world by virtue of those investments. So I think we, we have to think carefully about how we in particular can contribute to the, large, to the larger context of cultural enrichment. And in my view, for a place like the Met, co-investment is not an unreasonable question to ask in order for us to sustain who we are. It, it, it strikes me that some of the media reaction, well, has on the whole been quite negative to the Metropolitan, the Met's decision. And I wonder if I can ask some of the other panelists about whether they're surprised by some of the responses to uh, the decision uh, of the Met to start to put uh, fees up. I won't interrupt that question except to say <laughs> yeah, you just we did. were surprised <laughs> by how positive it was. Okay. So given what we were announcing, it, it was more balanced than we expected. Jerry Souths described it as a self-inflicted wound. Do you feel like that was a fair thing? To well, say? he's quite remarkable. He, he said many things, including that the Metropolitan is one of the most important cultural institutions in his world and in his life, and he deeply values it, and he pays a few bucks each time he comes. So if an enlightened person like that isn't prepared or willing to pay, as you wish, a, a level that is sustainable, why should we expect other people to do that? I tell you what I'm going to ask. I'm going to just interrupt and ask all of the, the, the panelists. What was the last museum you paid to go into, and, and was it worth it? <laughs> we, we, I mean, I think it's an interesting point that none of us sitting up here would expect necessarily to pay to go into museums because we're professionals, so we don't necessarily think on a level of a user of a museum what that value is of that particular spend. I mean, I don't know if any of you can remember. For me, it would be probably be an Italian museum because actually it's very hard and press cards don't always work in them. But uh. <laughs> And actually, I, I vividly remember um, it was the Prada Foundation um, both in Milan and in Venice, and I remember it because I was so outraged that they made me pay. I tried showing all my credentials, all my cards, and uh, I got nothing. I, I don't know, maybe the Prada family need that money for, to prop up the revenues, but uh, I don't know. If it, yes, Tom, you have a... I, I took my wife and children to a, um, a, a natural history museum that will remain nameless, uh, and to walk through the door cost our family, I think, about $117 for, for, for an 11-year-old, or actually, yeah, she was 11 at the time, a 9-year-old, an 11-year-old, and two 46-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> was, was it worth it? I didn't, I didn't evaluate it on its worth. I mean, I, 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 let me just take that a little bit further than I'm going to... Fourteen years ago, when I was working in Arizona, I actually looked at the AMD statistical survey for the first time in my life. And I did a little exercise, which was to take the expense budget of an institution and then and, and put that as the uh, numerator and put the number of visitors as the denominator and looked at a couple of institutions that were like mine. And the truth is, at an art museum, you're creating an experience that costs somewhere between 50 and $130 per visitor. And you just have to be honest and say, well, that's what it really costs if you want to measure the value of the institution in, in its totality over a significant period of time, like 12 months. Um, just, just consider that and then consider, you know, 15 bucks for a uh, person visiting from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Hartford. It, it's, it's a highly subsidized experience for every visitor except my board members. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look given, given that, that fact, that, that it, actually what a lot of people going to museums don't realize is the cost to the institution or the cost of a museum visit, whether they're paying, whether donors are paying, whether government or state funding is paying, 
Uh, let me ask you, I, I'll ask you, Savda, why do so many people assume that museums should be free? Because I think they do. They do. There is a perception out there that museums should be free. And I think people think that way because it goes into the emotional level. It is something that it should be that way as we think uh, of education of a great equalizer in our society. More accessibility to education, the more equal our society will be. Yes. I don't know if any other of the panelists want to respond on that idea. Why is it that we assume that museums should be free, libraries should be free? We'd never think that the theatre would be free, or going to the opera, certainly, we'd never think would be free. Well, I agree with you. I think it, it, it actually speaks well to the expectations people have about access to a public good in art museums. On the other hand, um, it's just not the reality that we face. In New York, there are many great museums that people have to pay to, to visit, and they don't mind whatsoever. But when we changed our policy at the Met, there was great outrage because we ought to be free. And so I asked the same question I ask all of you. Okay, let's be free. Who's going to pay for this institution? How should we? Do you want the Met to continue to be the place it is? Who pays? And they don't have answers for that question. There's just a kind of customary expectation. And certainly in other countries where the government does fund cultural institutions at a reasonable level, like in the UK, many of them are free. The Louvre, on the other hand, gets an enormous amount of federal funding, and it charges. Uh, so there are various models, but I think that expectation is not, doesn't square with exactly your point. People are willing to pay to go to the theater, they're willing to pay to go to the movies, but not to see masterpieces on the wall in an art museum. On, on this note about revenues, I want to ask the two museums that have, uh, uh, the Met also does now, but, but just to have a sense of, uh, for you, where you have local uh, uh, free access, but, uh, and, and that's come about for different reasons, but you also have ticket fees, admission fees for people who are out of towners. How important is the revenue to you, to your operating budget? How central is that? Could you do without it? Could you easily f raise the funds in another way, both to Salvatore and Tom? So for the DI, we have an operating budget of $35 million a year, and revenue in ticket sales is $1 million. So $1 million. In How hard would it be for you to, f to make that up? <laughs> Finding a donor, a TAFAP well, or something? Well, uh, yeah? honestly, I would like to have even more revenue, if possible, because it's important for us as we strengthen our operating endowment at the DIA. But, um, you know, exhibitions cost much more than... Uh, other things. And, and what's the case uh, at the Wadsworth Half Moon? Yeah, so the Wadsworth budget's about $10 million, and one-sixth of the budget is generated through enterprise activities. And if you, so if you look at the net of the shop, uh, the net of the shop is smaller than the admissions net. But, but again, it's the, where half of our operating budget is raised dollars, raised annually. A third of our operating budget is, comes from our investment base. Look, we talked about... Uh, funding from other places. I mean, there are other ways in which there is sort of indirect tax break funding in terms of people giving things and getting tax breaks in this country against donations to museums. You know, is, isn't there a sense in which these objects are owned by all of the people who are uh, kind of the people who are all the other taxpayers in this country. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I've asked the question kind of, it's a bit garbled, I, I, I admit, but I d I, can I ask that question to you, Daniel, if, if it made sense? Well, I'm not sure I know what the question is, but well, let I... Me, uh, let me try again then. Um, yeah. The question really is that if, if people are giving donations, large collections to museums, uh, these are the things that they're getting tax breaks against, right? Uh, so what's happening there in terms of that tax offer, who owns that sort of sense of where the money is? Is it, is it not something that is part of, it, it's national, it's owned by all of the people of the country? It is an indirect way in which this country invests in education and culture and philanthropic activity by effectively subsidizing through tax breaks, those kinds of contributions. On the other hand, I'll stay with the Met, the collection is one of the strongest collections of art in the world. And it is a remarkable fact that the entire museum is filled with donations. We weren't created with the royal or imperial collection that provided the foundation, like the other great museums. This was a social experiment of great audacity in 1870. A bunch of citizens of New York thought we need culture like the Louvre. This is a, a burgeoning city without a lot of culture. And from that moment to this, the institution has been filled with gifts, mm -hmm. and two million of them 
to be pre precise. And in, through tax abatements, yes, it has helped to subsidize that. So in that sense, the institution does hold a public trust of the art that we are stewarding. I think um, the collections, the Detroit Institute of Art collection, for example, belongs to everybody in our community. And everybody should have access to those collections, but the question is to ask as an organization, are we relevant to all the communities that, for example, surround the Detroit Institute of Arts? And by being relevant mean, are we accessible to all of them? And it is the admission uh, charge a, bar a barrier for this uh, accessibility, or are there other barriers that are not getting the people through the door because they are not interested in what we are doing. We are not doing the things that they, or they are, they are appealed to come or represent the communities in which we live. And I think that's another question that museums need to ask themselves. How the museum in the 21st century becomes a tool for the community whereby the collections, which are great, are not the end goal, but the platform from which we do things for the community, being relevant with them, working with them, to make sure that whatever we do at the DIA is interesting to them, they learn, and there are things that, as I mentioned, are, are relevant to the, to the cultures and, and communities. So are you, I mean, for you, would you say that, that an admission fee at that point is always a barrier to access to the museum? I, I'm not sure an admission fee is uh, always a barrier to uh, some communities. If I am doing always the same specific programs at the DIA, I will always have the same people coming in. And uh, whether other communities are interested or not, the, 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 the admission fee will not be relevant to them. But if I'm able to, to do many different things that make those communities feel represented and may those communities want to come to the DIA, then I'm truly giving accessibility to, to the collection. Tom, if I can just jump in because I do think that um, something that makes definitely Salvador and I um, very different and perhaps Tom as well from the Met um, is that we're not in high tourist areas. And um, you know nobody comes to Minneapolis between about November and May. <laughs> Apart from if you had the Super Bowl. Right? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even the Super Bowl was uh, a challenge. So, um, and so, you know, the perspective is different when you're very much serving your community and looking at constant, you know, repeat visitation and don't have that influx of tourists like the Met does. Sure. For a World Cultures Museum, which is our current word for a universal museum or encyclopedic museum or what used to be called a museum, perhaps, Aren't all of the tourists coming part of the community of that museum? If you're going to the Met, I mean, the, the, the boundary has been drawn as, as New York State for people coming in uh, and, and still f uh, taking the pay-as-you-wish policy. But nowadays, given that we are so much in a place where the politics of restitution, and not even just the legal sense of it, but whether or not there's a moral imperative to think about returning objects or putting them on long-term loan. If, I'm, if I come from Nigeria to the museum and I want to see the Benin bronzes in a world cultures museum that says, we protect world cultures and this is the best place for people of the world to see it, am I not part of that community? Should I not be able to see those things for free, uh, Daniel? We are very much hope that they come and visit. We'd be delighted to have them there, where they, these objects will be beautifully displayed, carefully studied, conserved perfectly, so that they will last for a very long time. Uh, on the other hand, somebody has to pay for that. That person who comes to New York, as you're describing, on average spends $1,200 for that weekend visit for a couple of days in New York. The question is, is it a reasonable thing to ask them to make a modest contribution to the well-being of the museum and to the collections that they have such a vital interest in. Because once again, our government is not doing that. So we hold in the public trust these great collections and we, our responsibility is to manage our resources in a transparent way that's consistent with our mission and we should be accountable for that. And I think we're doing that now. But on the other hand, still, somebody does have to pay for that. Tom, I'm glad you asked this because there is actually a, an international dimension that needs to be broached. And uh, from, the per, from the point of view of the International Council of Museums of ICOM, and thank you for mentioning in the, in the intro, 
um, we, we're amid a uh, listening project that's happening in 82 countries around the world where profession, museum professionals are being asked, what should the museum of the future look like? What are the greatest challenges in your society? What are the greatest challenges in your field within your society? What are the greatest challenges you see in the world? And, and what should we be doing about it? And I moderated the collection of, of some of these opinions uh, just last month. And one of our colleagues uh, said they, they invoked Black Panther during their response. <laughs> and I, I didn't think that we would be talking about vibranium axes uh, as, as part of this survey about, about what we should do about, uh, about the future. But there is, an, there is an unsettled discussion here in the United States about who owns the past. And it's, uh, it's much more complicated here where we don't have a unified ministry of culture, but rather that responsibility of the public trust has been pushed out into the fourth sector, this, this uh, private sector, nonprofit, uh, social good outcome, uh, which, which we're all professionals in. So, uh, I wanted to ask again about this this idea of the community because it seems fundam it seems a fundamental point of three of the four institutions we're talking about here that there are tiered access systems uh, and and I for me there's something slightly problematic just sort of um, in the idea of it perhaps not in the practice of it that you are creating perhaps a difficulty in terms of both the bureaucracy but you're also creating a place where people are having to prove themselves when they arrive at a museum as to where they're from and what right they have to pay or not pay. And, and how do you deal with that? I mean, is it a bit strange in, the, in this political climate, in this country, to be asking people to prove who they are when they arrive at a museum? Well, in Detroit, uh, because we have this uh, sp really specific uh, way of operating with the, with the millage, uh, free admission is for those who pay the admission in their taxes. So as long as they can show that they live in, the, in Oakland, Wayne, or Macomb counties, they can come in for free. Just or uh, or they have already paid for their ticket. A, a thought experiment, though. If, there, if there's somebody who perhaps is illegally in, in living in the Detroit area uh, and perhaps isn't paying their taxes, do you want them to be able to go into the museum for free? I'd like them to come in for free, yes. And well, they uh, won't yeah. because they're too afraid to show their ID and have the INS. This is, this be is what I mean. This is it's not just the bureaucracy of the gatekeeper, but actually, yes, Daniel. Yeah. Well, on this point, we struggled with this issue a lot. If we're going to have a, a preferential policy for New Yorkers, how do we determine their residency as we change this policy? We have seven million people come in our museum every every year, so managing crowds is also a challenge. And we tried something that I I would say was a little bit bold and risky, and that is we said. Our obligation is to communicate to the public as fully as we can what the policy is and why we're implementing it. And it, again, it has to do with what we've been talking about this afternoon. But that we will turn no one away for lack of identification. And we will simply tell them what we're doing and why we're doing it and ask them to support us. And it's remarkable how much they have. We've not thrown anyone out. One person came in on the second day with a Yankee hat and said, I'm a New Yorker, that's my proof. <laughs> And we said, welcome, we're delighted to have you, and next time if you, if you want to bring something else, that'd be okay. But 95, 98% of the people who come through our door are just not going to fight with us. And we don't, if, if you really want to come to the museum for free, you can come. It's okay. Because actually what we're here to do is really work with the vast majority of people who want to do the right thing. And they have. So we're not checking anybody's ID unduly. Tom, similar for your, yeah. your Wadsworth welcome, but is it a welcome for everybody, or how does that work? We're absolutely welcome to everybody, and uh, my staff was anxious about how would we verify, and I said, verify? Are you an accountant? Uh, so uh, we only ask people that want to sign up for the Wadsworth Welcome Program five questions. Their name, the year they were born, their email address, their home address, and the languages spoken at home. That's it. Uh, if they show us a Hartford um, library card, that's fine. I don't, we, we don't verify ID. And then we give them, I was fumbling around for my keys, we give them a little thing just like they do at the grocery store so that they can live on their keychain and they can come whenever they want. And that's how we know who's actually coming, how often they're coming. And uh, we've actually brought uh, focus groups in 
based on the kind of power user, the occasional user, the signed up came once, hasn't come back in four months. Um, and it's, so it's, it's about expanding accessibility in the end. I mean, this, this again is that point. I mean, I'm, I, uh, it's interesting for me to sit here because obviously I live in London. I live in a place where our national museums for the last 15, 20 years or so have been free, and they've been free to both tourists and they've been free to, to citizens of the United Kingdom, so both to taxpayers and non-taxpayers. And it's really interesting to see this point. I mean, do you envy when you go to, to, to London? Do you think, wow, this is, this is great? Or do you think, how the heck do they pay for this? When I was researching this policy change, I did exactly that. I went to London and I met with the directors of the National Gallery and the British Museum, and I asked that question. Because they, they struggle financially. There are lots of things the British Museum cannot do because of shortage of funds. So I said, have you ever thought about it? And he said what Kaywin said, which is a core value of this institution is to be free. It's who we are, it's what we do, and we'll figure it out, but we will not charge. And I totally respect that. So that, what, that's their view, that's who their identity is. And as a result of that, they provide a certain kind of service to the public. Although I will say there's a fair amount of evidence that would suggest People don't come to the museum because it's free. And they, once we made our announcement, there was some research that came forward and said that's not what governs museum visiting behavior. But that said, it's a core value in the UK to do this, and they pay a price for it, but they're, they're willing to live yeah, with that. I, mean, I think one of the interesting things is that for us the question at the moment, and with the National Gallery in particular, is that uh, you know now for the first time the National Gallery has an exhibition where the charge for to see Monet and architecture is 22 pounds. So the first time it's been more than 20 pounds. That's the controversy that the exhibitions are there to subsidise uh, the the, pr the permanent collections. But but it's it's this thing with you and I wanted to ask about visitor behaviour. You know, if you're free, you know, do you notice the difference? How do people? How do people work with the permanent collection when they visit for free? Well, when you're free, people come often. They, they just repeat visit, visit, visitation. But uh, I think what uh, research has shown is that we have not broadened our audiences. It's always, or often it's always the same people who come back to the museum and perhaps spend less time than in a longer visit. Uh, one thing that I'm always um, excited about is that the of our attendance each year, se around 70-75% uh, of our visitors come to see the permanent collection. So even though we don't have a high tourist population, it means again that the public is coming back again and really enjoying the collection. And so it means we have to work harder to get people in the exhibitions, but um, it's, it warms the museum director's heart to have people actually coming for the permanent collection. Uh, last time I. Last time I checked, 63% of the Wadsworth Welcome card holders are younger than me. And that's, that's it. That's all I can say. Yeah, museum directors get old quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it ever, was it ever, sorry, was it, was it ever a, a consideration that, that the Met, which obviously has a, a really busy exhibition program, you know, you can go into the Met and you can find, that, oh, well, I've got to see that, and I've got to see that, and that. So I've got to spend two days in here just looking at the temporary exhibitions. How close might you have come to just charging for some of those exhibitions rather than charging the entire fee? That was one of the, the opportunities we explored very carefully, and we, those were the two choices we ultimately we faced, whether we charge for s some special exhibitions. We ultimately decided not to do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, we do somewhere between 45 and 55 exhibitions a year, and the idea would be we would charge for a handful of those. So we'd have to decide which ones we're going to charge for and which ones we're not going to charge for. Second, if ultimately the purpose of charging for exhibitions is to have predictable income that you can budget against and plan resources around, make commitments around, then you end up having to manage the exhibition schedule around the revenues. And the Met has never done that. When we sit and plan our exhibition schedules, we never ever talk about what it means for our rev bottom line revenues. We certainly have a sense of if we're going to do Michelangelo, that may draw more people than if we're going to do someone no one ever heard of. But we never plan that way. And as soon as you start down that, that path, it's going to dictate the kinds of planning we do. And that we thought that was a mission-related activity, and we wouldn't do that. So ultimately, we discarded that idea for those reasons. It, it does seem to me, though, that in, in principle, what we started with, your feeling is that people need to realize uh, that, that, they, that culture has a cost 
and that therefore people need to learn to respect that and to think about it and consider it when, when they visit. So uh, how important actually is the revenue that, that the Met is trying to make up through this, uh, this new policy? Or is it more that this is a kind of a strategic, this is part of the mission that, that culture is something that if people want to access it, they've got to learn that it comes with a cost? I hold the very strong view that one of the fundamental values that, that we who lead cultural institutions or universities must hold there, dear is the right for freedom of expression. The ability for our curatorial staff and our professional staff to do what they think is best for advancing the field that we serve and the public interest. The best way to do that is to have a diversity of revenue sources so that we are not beholden or owned by anyone. And I'll say something slightly controversial, but look at institutions that are majority owned by the government and what kind of programming they're able to do. It affects their decision making. And we have a diversity of revenue that about 10% of our income comes from admissions, not unlike what we're hearing here in this panel. We have revenue generating activities of all sorts, restaurants and retail and all of those things. We have annual giving, we have special events, and then we have the endowment. Collectively, that diversity of resources allows us to be independent. We have get less than 10% of our funding from the city of New York. It's important to us, but they don't own us, and they don't tell us what our programming should be. So I think ultimately every bit is important because that model of co-investment ultimately provides the greatest good to society, which is that we can be a voice of freedom and integrity. I don't think anyone would doubt that the, these are vital things. The freedom itself, the freeness of the museum, Kaywin, does it, do you find, help to create other revenue streams? Do you find that there's a kind of different type of community engagement or giving somewhere like Minneapolis because of the principle that the museum is free? Uh, absolutely. And um, I, from the moment we announced that we were going free, I think we had it initially 30,000 members. And so people would always ask, why would somebody be a member if you can get in for free? And, and there's definitely this feeling that you want to be a member of MIA because it goes to support the free admission. And um, it's also very, very important for our donors. And I think there have been several museums that have actually launched, you know, had donors support a free admission campaign because they recognize that it does help to leverage other funds. And, and has that happened with the millage? Oh, there go the questions. In, in Detroit, uh, more of a sense of, of what other people can do and contribute more in Detroit after that tax was, uh, was passed. Uh, I think, um, and this is something that I'm living right now as a director, that uh, the museum receives every year right now around $24 million from the three counties and I have all the residents that live around the museum. So I want to be independent in my programs, but I can really be totally independent in my programs. I don't know. I have to have a relationship with the community by which I can create programs that are those programs that our curators want to do, but at the same time resonate with the hopes and vision that those commu that community has for the DIA. They are paying, they are supporting us, and in a way, they are owning us. So it's a really interesting and a very productive relationship because we are, in a way, changing the culture of the museum. In the past, as an organization, we were looking a little bit inwards and we were holding tight to that independence. But now, because we have that support, we have to go beyond the walls of the museum. And we have to co-create, we have to listen, we have to really understand what these residents want and bring that to the level of the museum quality. Well, if, you, if you want to go beyond the walls of a museum, the doors have to be as open as possible, right? Always necessary. Look, I've dropped the questions on the floor, which probably is a sign that, that uh, it's time to open up to the audience uh, for uh, other questions. Uh, and that's perfect, because I said we would do about 45 minutes. So let me open to the floor. I don't know whether perhaps there's a microphone or, or not. Or, uh, are there any questions from the audience? There's a gentleman uh, here on the right-hand side. Thank you. And I got a question from Matt. Uh, I'm one of the Apollo members, and I think I love the program you guys offered as a public institution. My question is, uh, 
as a polo member, can we have more engagement ways to, uh, for the mu organized by the museum to interact with artists to have more things? Because right now, Apollo, you guys have program every month, and sometimes uh, the event is like a cocktail party. But can we have more direct ways to go to the studio with an artist? That's my question. It's a great question. I don't see why not. I will bring it back to our team and tell them what you asked and see if we can find an artist for you. So I think there's a, uh, sure. Any other questions? There's a gentleman there. Hi, I have a question about this sort of uh, larger issue of government funding not really showing up in our museums and how that affects things. Um, it seems like for people who really want museums to be free, there would be a natural uh, kind of imperative for them to say, okay, we want to take that qualm to governments to try to get laws changed, to try to get funding directed towards museums. But I also know that museums have traditionally been seen as sort of non-political or apolitical institutions. And that's maybe part of the appeal, part of the reason that people trust them. Um, so how do you deal with that line? Like, have you thought about trying to direct your members towards political action, or do you think that that's a line that you as a museum shouldn't cross? If, if, I, might, if I might take that, um, two things to say. Uh, one, the, the marvelous renovation of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, which en en enables a 175-year-old museum to um, present art with the dignity and intimacy that, that has always been the goal from Daniel Wadsworth tearing down his house and building a place for art on Main Street. It's a, I mean, it's a beautiful treasured thing. But the majority of the renovation funds came from the state of Connecticut. The state of Connecticut provides no operating dollars for our institution. The city of Hartford provides no operating dollars for, for our institution. I mean, there are, there are IMLS grants and NEA grants, but it's you know, it's programmatically based and, and what have you. Um, I, I think that in that atmosphere, I knew I needed to take the first step and, and rededicate the place back to the public. Uh, that's allowed for a double digit growth in contributed income since we made that decision. Um, it has had no effect on the government's capacity to or appetite for um, turning us into a state-supported institution. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment on, on this relationship between, or, or does anyone ever think that there will be a, a, more of a sense of government funding for museums in this country? It's not really a, it's not really a possibility in the make of, of the museum system. Uh, just one small point that um, we uh, uh, don't pay taxes our institutions, and so we actually do receive government support because we're subsidized by not paying taxes. So it's it's an important point. Well, our, our local government supports the DI right now. I, as I mentioned, with this millage, which is uh, seventy percent of our operating expenses every year, and a millage for those who are not that familiar is a, a tax based on property. Basically, a resident of Oakland, Winter Macomb, who owns a house that is worth two hundred thousand dollars pays the DIA $20 every year. And that's the support that we get, 25 million in total, more or less. So we are supported by, by the local government right now. So in, in a sense, everyone in Detroit voted to become a member of DIA. Yes, they yeah. own the DIA, they, and we want them to feel they own the collection and the museum and support us. That's fantastic. There's a lady in the second row here who has a question. Um, I wanted to know, do you know examples of completely auto-sustainable museums? No endowment, n nothing like that. Does, it, does this exist? And also, would you be open to exploring ways where public and private sector would be interacting more fluidly? Maybe with the expertise you have, you could start offering consult payable consultancy services to private entities, something like that. Uh, let's take the first question. Does anyone on the panel know uh, of a uh, uh, self-sufficient museum, I suppose, is, is, is the question that pays for itself? Well, I, I think we all do. <laughs> I deliver a balanced budget, but I, I, I didn't quite uh, understood. 
without endowment donation so or earned or earned revenue the or revenue. only earned revenue? I mean, it's a it's a sort of musée imaginaire of, of a budget where where all of earned revenues pay for all of the activities of the museum. Well, I, I think that's called the op the observation deck of of uh, One World. I mean, it's, it's so it's. It, that there are cultural, I, I mean that seriously, uh, th there are cultural attractions which I think are completely uh, earned revenue, but I don't think you would recognize them as uh, mission-driven organizations in pursuit of reconnecting people with their own humanity, which is what we are as art museums. There's, there's not enough calm and space if everything's about a transaction. In the second question uh, is about whether consultancy services might be something that you could offer the expertise, the scholarship, the people, even the collections. Is that something that you consider for, I'm going to go all the way along for, for the museums, or, or what, to what extent do you already offer that? I'll start at the other end then. Oh, well, we, we do a tremendous amount of that, but we don't charge for it. We do it all over the world. We send conservation staff to India to do programs to help train conservators there at our expense. We lead a global uh, museum leaders conference every other year at our expense. We work with museums in New York City and conserve their art at our expense. So we believe that's part of our mission. And we, we haven't monetized that. In theory, we could, but we haven't. I would also add that because of the public trust, we have to be really careful about what we monetize and um, the sort of selling of um, expertise to private citizens um, working with deal. There's just a, because, say, the public trust is one of the most important assets that we all have, that we're all very careful about how we work with outside entities and money. We do this as well, uh, like the MET. Uh, offer conservation services and expertise is part of our mission. It's a way for us to, uh, to be a tool for the community, and uh, uh, it's, it's a good thing that we do, so no charge. There's a question at the back, and then we'll come to the front. It is, okay. Um, in relation to the Met, it was brought up specifically that it's an institution that generates expertise in the form of conservation, but also in regards to internships. And I was wondering if with the increased revenue through tickets um, and admission costs to the museum, if it was a consideration to expand those programs and for example, in the fall and spring to make those internships paid, internships, um, things of that regard to really use this as an opportunity, not only relating to the internships, but to expand uh, those forms of expertise which um, promote the ge next generation of scholars. Well, we already at the Met have the most generous paid internship program in the world. And uh, the challenge we're facing and what precipitated the policy change in admissions in the first place is um, that we have a budget deficit. So we are still trying to develop a sustainable model. And we are on a path to doing that. I'm confident that we will get where we're going in another year and we'll have a balanced budget. But our goal as a, I, the Met is, like all of these institutions, we're perpetual institutions, which means we have an obligation to plan and steward our resources and build our facilities forever. And that distinguishes us from every other kind of organization, that businesses, for example, that have a very different mission. And therefore, as we think about financial planning, it has to be with the long term in mind so that every incremental decision we make is sustainable. Every curator we hire, every work of art that we acquire, whatever it is, we have to make sure we can, we can afford that over the long term. And at this moment, one of the things that, that we all love about the Met is that we're doing more than we can afford. And so when we find that level of genuine balanced budget with some surpluses, I'll give you a call. There's a question in the front row here. Thank you. Um, the question is very simple. The yeah, sections, yes, no, maybe. We know that uh, MoMA does that all the time. Uh, now the Baltimore Museum is the association of some works in, via software business in Excel. But each one of you come from a different, different background. In your case, uh, in Detroit, um, the people own the museum through your own words. In your case, you said like 70% of your collection is what um, people come to see. So you probably do not want to the access to buy other works that you don't know they're gonna come see them. So the question is to each one of you, yes, no, maybe. I, 
I think we probably all do it. We certainly do. Um, of course, we all abide by the rule that if you deaccession something, that that money has to stay in the collection so that you buy more art in the collection with the funding so it's not used for operating, so it doesn't help pay any of those operating costs. But yes, absolutely, we, we do deaccession. It's a way to keep the collection relevant, to refine it, to bring new things to the community. It's, it's a healthy uh, internal process. There's a question just uh, behind in the second row. Um, I'm thinking of that Michael Govan quote where he said it's easier to raise 500 million for a building than 50 million for acquisitions. Um, how hard of a sell is it to major donors um, free admission versus something like putting a wing with your name on it? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that um, donors choose, they're, they're gifts, right? We're, we're soliciting with an agenda. Uh, we all have solicitation plans. Um, at our institutions that, that try to uh, harness the enthusiasm of a, of a potential donor base and, and direct them to things that are mission critical for the institution. So I, I think a lot of that pressure happens um, within the management side of things rather than in the donorscape or on the board. Um, buildings are incredibly expensive. Buying first rate uh, works of art that can help you tell compelling stories about the past or about today are expensive. I think, you know, Michael's got a particular um, situation in Los Angeles that, that is very different than ours. Um, my, my institution's literally 176 years old, and the oldest acquisition endowments were established in 1920. Uh, so we have more buying power than Michael's institution, which is 50 years old. Um, you know, physically, I'm in a 380-year-old city, and I think people started living um, in Los Angeles uh, sometime in the late 18th century. They were they were fishermen, uh, and then it became a modern city about 100 years ago. So I I think you have to uh, look at those different histories and profiles for, for uh, communities as well as their institutions and then match that with what's happening uh, in terms of their population. I mean, um, Connecticut is 7% uh, new Americans or, or actually immigrants who have yet to naturalize um, in an incredibly stable situation. And, and that's radically different than a place like, I don't know, Charleston, South Carolina or uh, on a different scale, uh, a place like Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, it, it may seem like a, a kind of wishful thinking, but did the Met ever, did you try? Was it worth even considering trying to, to see whether someone would step in and say, we're going to cover that part of the budget to keep it pay as you wish for everybody for the next 10 years? Or is that just a sort of a thought experiment. Well, every, every one of these options were under consideration and discussion, but for the reasons we've discussed this past hour, I don't think that's a responsible solution to the problem. And we, we, we actually could have found a donor who would have bought us 10 years, and then we'd be right back here in 10 years. And the question ultimately is who should pay for culture and how does it advance the needs of society? And whether people agree with us or not, we made a decision in that basis. It wasn't a financial exigency that drove the decision. It was the combination of our moral responsibility to be sustainable and healthy with our need to, to ask the communities that benefit to invest. Uh, we get enormous philanthropic support from our donors. That's why the Met is what it is. But they shouldn't be asked to pay for every single thing. They're private citizens who step up and help us. And again, it's about proportionality, I think. If I could just say that um, I, I just have to, to express how uncomfortable I am that we are sitting here on Park Avenue at this blue chip fair where they advertise champagne and oysters, and all of us represent this point of privilege. If we'd had this conversation in another par other parts of town, perhaps with 20-year-olds, there'd be a very, very different conversation about who pays for culture. And I just think it's important to acknowledge that um, this is all from a very singular perspective. Well, I think 
at that point and that note, that's a good thing for everybody to go away and think about. Uh, drink champagne and, and drink champagne. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for coming. Thank you to our panel. <laughs> that will do. Um, I hope you will come back to a TAFAF coffee talk every morning at 11 o'clock in this space. And we have three more afternoons, so I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much for your support.